Hello everyone. Welcome back to my wine channel. This is Trophy Wine Hunter. Today I'm doing a review of another great wine from the Right Bank region. It is the 1999 Chateau Pavie. A little bit about Chateau Pavie. It is in the saint emilion region on the right bank and it lies uh, very high up on the plateau. I probably will do another video just on my visit to Chateau Pavie. I was um, so honored to visit the vineyard and I can talk about my experiences there and maybe I think I have some uh, pictures from that trip. So not videos, but pictures and maybe I can just uh, go through some of the pictures and what I learned at the uh, vineyard. But anyways, the uh, Chateau Pavie is a very old vineyard. It's been around since the fourth century. Um, and it takes its name actually after the orchards of peaches or pavies on the vineyard site. Now, I don't think I went to the vineyard. I don't recall any peaches there. I re actually recall honeybees, but I don't recall any peaches there. So it's kind of funny that it's named after peaches and there's no peaches there. But it kind of also means that it's a serious winery and it's not a hokey, right? It doesn't need these hokey things and have a little peach tree there to sell or sell peaches there to um, make their winery great. So uh, in a way that's kind of comforting that they're not um, too commercialized. It was, uh, it's been around again to, since the fourth century, really didn't get into prominence as I'll go through history until um, probably around 1998. And um, in 2012, it was classified a premier Grand Cru, Cru Class A, A which is the highest destination for the St. Amion region. Um, we just had another reclassification of the St. Amion system and in just recently in the last couple of weeks. And um, it again was rated a Grand Cru Class A, a um, vineyard with, or winery, which is the top um, level in St. Amion along with uh, Chateau Fijac. Obviously, knowing that um, Chateau Ausson, Chateau Cheval Blanc, and Chateau Angelis have come out of that classification system. But that's for another topic. What was known, what is known today as Chateau Pavie, has a long history, was really assembled by a person called Ferdinand Buffard in the late 19th century. But through predecessors, um, they had some troubles and they were start, starting to sell off parts of Chateau Pavie. So you'll also see um, Pavi de Caisse, and also there's another one called Pavi Macan. Um, parts, they're obviously close, because they have the Pavi name, they're close to Chateau Pavi. Um, probably some of their vineyards were originally part of the original Chateau Pavi, and uh, that's why they share that name, uh, the similar name. So Pavi Macan, Pavi de Caisse, probably are very close by um, to Chateau Pavi. So Mr. Buffard sold most of his winery, or most of the interest in Pavi after World War I. He was having some troubles, um, sold it to a person called Albert Port, who then sold it to Andre Alexandre Vallette in 1943. And really Pavi um, over the years has been a decent performing wine. It really didn't get um, to the next level until it was purchased by a person called Gerard Peirce in 1998 for the sum of $31 million. And of course, that was a huge sum at that time. Um, and that kind of uh, equates to my tasting notes. I recall uh, we did um, at a restaurant open up a very old bottle of um, Chateau Pavie, I think in the 60s. Um, thinking you know that pavi of today is like that and it was quite um in our minds quite disappointing um but that's again now that i know the history um, that's not surprising pavi really didn't come into its own um and really have owners of um who really i guess had the money and had the um passion for the winery to make it great uh, until uh, Gerard Peirce purchased it in 1988. So Peirce was a um, Parisian millionaire. 
Um, he's a former cyclist who has two supermarket chains. Um, he also bought Montbousset and Pavi de Caisse um, uh, prior to buying Chateau Pavi. So lots of money, lots of notoriety, lots of friends. Um, he spent a ton of money and he's actually spent, um, he basically gutted the whole thing and replaced everything in 2000 and then did it again in 2011. So he's really spent a ton of money on this. He brought in um, Michel Roland. He put in a new irrigation system, a new cellar, new vats. He cut the fields. Um, he did a, a tremendous amount. So now Pavi is really producing um, at its uh, most. He was, and if you recall my other videos about Michel Roland, he came up um, with the Robert Parker and he is likes this bold style of wine, very alcoholic, very bold flavors that um, Robert Parker likes and also that uh, Gerard Pars likes. So Pavi has become a bit of a controversial wine. Um, I would equate it to almost like the um, Ponte Canet of the right bank. Um, Ponte Canet has changed quite a bit in terms of its style but somehow it gets accolades and somehow Pavi gets, um, I don't know, um, some, some trouble or because it's, again, some people like that austere backward style um, and they don't like uh, foreign influences. They, they don't think it's French. To me, I've never known anything else than modern Pavi. And so um, it is a stronger wine and generally I don't like bold wines, but I don't think it's overpowering. Um, it is among the right bank wineries um, stronger and bolder, but uh, nowhere near um, left bank um, kind of strength and boldness. So this is a really interesting wine to drink from a historical perspective because this, in 1999, this was when Gerard Purse was um, just had purchased the winery and started to make renovations. So this is kind of a transition. You'll taste a little bit of old style Pavi, and then you'll taste the upcoming, um, what's in the future for Pavi. And now we have hindsight, we know what the future was for Pavi and it's magnificent. But it's really interesting. This is a very historical wine and has, I think, um, some significance if you want to understand Pavi and the nature of Pavi. Um, and that's why I think it's really important to have that historical context and not just look at today's wines. Um, you really have to understand where that winery came from and what its roots are. And um, so Pavi has, has a great location, but never had the passion and the money to back it all the way back till the 17, 1800s. So when Mr. Buffard had it, he had quite a bit of money when he bought it, but went through some tough times with phylloxera and the economy. And the next owners just probably didn't, probably had some money, but didn't have the passion and didn't have an overload of money. When you have a guy like Gerard Purse, he has connections, he has passion, and um, he, he has that, um, I guess with other wineries, he's got that strength. He wants that vision to bring it back to its um, greatness. And I think really that's what has happened. Pavi is now producing at a level where it should be. And this goes back to the um, our talk about terroir, why terroir is so important and why the growth system is so important. To me, as I drink um, more and more in Burgundy and Bordeaux and I understand terroir and the systems, the more it makes sense to me. Because when we talk about uh, Grand Cru or we talk about uh, growths, growth wines, I think we have to talk about the potential of the wine, not what the wine is performing today, but what it could perform if you had the right owners and the right owners who have passion. And this is, a, a Pavi is a classic example. Um, it's It was always a good wine. It was always historically a decent wine, but never... I don't think in the same conversation of Cheval Blanc and Osson and Angelis. Um, today, you've got the right owner and you've got the um, right people who 
really have a passion for the wine and want this wine to shine and therefore you're getting the production of this wine at the highest level and there are some wineries out there that are great um, but unfortunately because of their terroir it doesn't matter how much money you had even if Gerard Purse was in control of that winery it still wouldn't make the same wine as Chateau Pavie as evidenced by his other wineries Mont Bosquet and uh, Pavie de Caisse which are owned by him probably have the same um, facilities in terms of money but probably don't have the terroir to match Chateau Pavie. The winery has about 42 hectares um, planted 50% Merlot, 30% Cabernet uh, Franc and 20% I think it's um, Cabernet Sauvignon and you'll see that that Cabernet Sauvignon will um, decrease uh, a little bit more over time. I think they want to kind of get out of there and that's kind of proper. Probably Cabernet Franc doesn't grow as well on the right bank as Merlot and Cabernet. Cabernet Sauvignon doesn't grow as well as Cabernet Franc and Merlot on the right bank side. Um, it's aged in barrel every year between um, 70 to 100 percent in new oak and between 18 and 32 months. I couldn't find the information about the exact blend on this um, vintage so if anyone knows they can let me know and about 70,000 bottles that's probably uh, 6,000 cases something like that is produced a year um, so that's kind of a average production um, I think quite big for um, right bank wines let's look at the cork this is my fault it wasn't a dry cork it was just me um, not putting my cor uh, cork screw in deep enough and just pulling um, and just assuming I could just uh, just pull it out but uh, you always need some um, finesse so you should not be especially with old corks um, 1999 is I have to remember 23 years old um, I should have you know been more careful and I treated it like a brand new cork so that's my fault um, you'll see it's the label. It's a Premier Grand Cru Class A, uh, 1999. Um, this was before it was Grand Cru Class A A, so uh, the new bottles will have the uh, Grand Cru Class A A. So um, again, this is kind of neat. That's the picture of the vineyard, which I've been to, and maybe I'll do another video on this. I bought this at auction, and this collector was quite serious. I guess he labeled everything on the back with Robert Parker's rating so that's kind of nice uh, bottle is very nicely stored and here's the wine it's still uh, it shows maybe a little bit of um, brownness around the edge but uh, pretty good color I think it's got lots of time um, but it's drinking nicely right now I would say it's at its plateau and it will stay here for the next uh, I'd say five years or eight years easily. Let's taste the wine. And I let you, I'll let you know that I've had quite a few bottles of 1999 Apavi in with different people in different settings and never been quite that impressed with it. But now that I know the historical context, it puts a different light into it. I look at it a different way. And again, that's why history, history is so important in historical context. Because if you're judging this wine by today's standard, it's probably, you're going to be a little disappointed. This doesn't taste like 2015 or even 2010 Pavi. But if you see it for the historical context, like this is a wine that um, just was produced just when Gerard Purse was starting to, um, which overtook the winery starting to change things. He actually overhauled the winery in two years. So it was a very quick transition. Things were done quickly, he put in a lot of money into it. But um, it's a historically significant wine to understand Pavi because it is um, somewhat, you can see what it was before uh, Gerard Purse's uh, involvement and you can also see the future. So in that context it's a much more significant wine and interesting wine for me um, knowing this so this has been open a couple of days on the smell again it's got um, 
an old school kind of aroma to it. It's now a couple of days, so it's really aired out a bit more with that um, uh, almost like a boysenberry anise red fruit aroma with some minerality and earthiness. Um, but it doesn't have, if you compare to modern pavi, and I'm talking the last 10 year pavi or even 2003 pavi, it doesn't have the strength and it doesn't have the real dark fruit and doesn't have the vibrancy. So um, it's kind of a very interesting wine because you can see uh, baby steps, but you can see that it is quite um, different. It, it's a different type of wine than what we would currently know as Pavi. On the taste, good acidity, it's light, um, it's medium bodied, which again is not consistent with what you would find with modern pavi, which is powerful, very um, heavy on the fruit, especially dark fruit. This is actually quite light on the fruit. Um, it could be its age also. The aftertaste, you've got the oak, you get um, kind of a, a charring, a charred oak, some of bit of tar, um, and a little bit of tobacco and licorice. So the back end tastes quite a bit like modern pavi, the structure, but it's much lighter in style uh, in my mind. It does, it's almost, I wouldn't say dilute, but comparatively to modern pavi, it's much lighter in terms of the taste profile. Um, but it's got those some characteristics of what I would um, uh, think of when I drink modern pavi. A little bit light, I would say. Yeah, it's an interesting style. Um, I'm trying to compare it to even um, off vintage pavi or weaker vintages of pavi. Um, like um, maybe like 07. I think if you were gonna choose a modern day pavi, it would taste a little bit like 07 pavi. Um, a, a little bit lean and um, on the structure. Not as much fruit as you would see from pavi. It'd be really interesting if people tried to blind taste people on this on the vertical. Could you tell which one? Um, I'm not sure people could tell this is pavi because it is got a leanness to it um, that um, might trick you a little bit because it doesn't it doesn't really carry the um, the Merlot is in the softness and in the minerality and the earthiness. But there's a lean component to this that um, is tricky. Um, so I think this would be a really interesting vintage to taste blind, uh, especially for Pavi lovers. Um, I've tasted the 98 before, which is a little bit heavier, and 2003, which has a little bit more um, tannic structure. And it, when you see with 03, you also see a lot more fruit um, forwardness. His style, the style of and the influences of the new winery and um, Michel Roland is much more evident at, in the 03 vintage. Um, even in the 2001 vintage, I've, as I've also drank, it's much more evident than, that, than this 99. And again, it's so interesting historically, con uh, the historical context now that I know that it makes me um, more interested in this wine uh, rather than just blow it off as not a good wine. So. My rating of this wine is 90 points, uh, but it's a really, for me, um, a historically insignificant wine in my understanding of Pavi, because that brings me back to the style of Pavi, and it kind of gives me a um, bridge between my experiences of uh, new Pavi and my one experience with a very old bottle of Pavi, which was very lean and austere, and um, not that impressive. So this is a step up from the old Pavi, but um, 
in here you can see the mini steps that will now that now have blossomed in the modern day Pavi. So so interesting. That's why I find this wine um, quite interesting, um, and I hope that uh, you know viewers and subscribers who have a chance to drink this after seeing this video can appreciate that um, historical significance and the intrigue uh, of this wine. Hope you've enjoyed this tasting. Until next time, happy drinking.